Again, as it's already been said, we're just glad and thankful to be gathered here uh, together one more time and thankful to see another day and thankful to have another day that we can bless God for all that He means to us and all that He has done for us, saints. So uh, but we'll go into the Word of God here this morning. We'll try not to hold you too long, but we want to obey the Lord today. So if you have your Bibles, we want to invite you to turn with us. We'll be in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 13. The book of Hebrews, chapter number 13 in your New Testament. Hebrews 13. And while you find that, I'll go to the Lord in prayer this morning. (coughs) Heavenly Father, we love you this morning. And uh, we're just thankful, Lord, for everything you've done for us. We worship and praise you, Lord, for all that you are our Savior, our Lord, our Heavenly Father. We just give you praise today, Lord. And uh, Lord, I'm thankful to be able to stand here, Lord, as your servant in this place and in this assembly today. But uh, Lord, I pray, search me and try me, Lord. If there's anything in me, Lord, not right, forgive me. Lord, wash me and cleanse me now in this repentance. And Father, I pray, let it be nothing of me today to go forward, not my word, but let it be your word to go forward today, Lord, carried forth by your Spirit, as good seed upon the good soil of our hearts, Lord, that we may receive it. Lord, that it may be implanted. Lord, it may take root and bear much fruit in our lives to the glory of your holy name. Father, I pray, give us ears to see and uh, ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts to perceive, Lord, what your spirit says to the church. Father, I pray, let us be edified and rooted and established in you, built up together, Lord, in faith. More than anything, Lord, we pray and ask that you would be exalted and magnified. And we give you all the praise, Lord, for all things. And in Jesus' name do we pray. Church said amen. Amen. If you found Hebrews chapter 13, say praise the Lord. Lord. I want to read here from the book of Hebrews. (coughs) Beginning of the chapter, we're going to read two verses here. Hebrews chapter 13, beginning in verse number 1. The scriptures say, Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. We'll stop reading right there. Saints, the Bible, and especially the New Testament, is full of teachings about love, how that we ought to love our neighbor as ourselves, that we should love one another even as Christ has loved us. And of course, how that the whole world will know that we are Jesus' disciples and how that we love one another. And this is the central theme of God's Word simply because as the Scriptures declare, God is love. Jesus, whom we all know is God in the flesh, said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man may lay down his life for his friends. And you are my friends. Verily, saints, the Lord loves and he desires that we also love. If we say we love God, but we do not love our brother, we make a grave error today. For how can a man say that he loves God whom he has not seen and not love his brother whom he has seen? Truly, saints, this blessed Word of God calls us to love not in word only, but also in deed, in our actions. We must not only be hearers of the Word, but doers also. And the Word speaks this morning here from this epistle written to the Hebrews, of which it says, Let brotherly love continue. Now the writer here speaks as it pertains to those that are in the church. When he says, let brotherly love continue, he's talking about us in the church. Those that who are made brothers and sisters in Christ under one heavenly Father. And we truly are the family of God this morning. Each one of us are blood related, having the same love of God and blood of Christ shed abroad in our hearts, as the Bible says. Even so, beloved, as the scriptures direct... And as God speaks this morning through the Scriptures, let us truly keep brotherly love among ourselves. 
long-suffering and forbearance and not quick to suspect evil of the other. Go read 1 Corinthians chapter 13 uh, for a review of how we should love and how we shouldn't. Now, as the church of Jesus Christ, we're not only called to love those within the church, but those who are outside too. How many times did our Lord direct us in His Word to look after and care for any who had need? He told a parable one time about the great Samaritan talking about that you should love your neighbor, but Lord, who is my neighbor? Any human being is our neighbor. Any fellow man is our neighbor. And we ought to love them and help them. Jesus said that even the vile tax collectors loved those who loved them back. But what profit or reward was there in that? He instructed us even to love those who persecutes us and those who hate us and to treat them well and to love them. And if they hunger, feed them. If they thirst, give them to drink. Lord Jesus said further that we should feed those who are hungry, give drink to the thirsty, help a stranger, clothe the naked, visit the sick and those that are imprisoned. For as much as we do it unto the least of those His brethren, saints, He said we've done it unto Him. So the writer of Hebrews here, along with loving the brethren within the church, does not neglect neglect to direct us to love those who are outside the church as well. Specifically, and to read verse 2 again, it says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers. For thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Saints, I think it appropriate that as we enter into this Christmas season, that we all not forget to bless and curse not, to love with fervent charity, to forgive. And people say, well, I forgive, but I don't forget. You might as well forget about it. If God will forget our sins... Come on. If God forgets our, He said, I blocked them out. As if they don't even exist. We might as well have go on and forgive and forget. And love and bless and curse not. And love with a fervent charity. Giving without an expectation of return. I think it would be well with us to be Christians. To be kind. To be meek and lowly and gentle with hearts full of humbleness this morning. Let us do good to one another and to all that we meet. But saints, these should not be things that we only do in the Christmas season. No, as Christians, this should be our default behavior year round. We should not default to evil speaking and accusations and and neglecting to do good when we have the ability to. Our default should be to love one another, to love those within the church and to love those without the church. Only we should let this season of Christmas be be a reminder to us that as the free gift of love that has been given unto us, let us freely give it to others also. And haven't we received already the greatest gift of love on that first Christmas night when the Lord was born into the world to save sinners, to make men new and deliver us from death and hell and the grave? Weren't we also loved freely more than we ever will in this life ever again? Let us give freely the gift of love also. Not only in the church and towards fellow Christians, but to strangers as well. For you never know when you might be entertaining or serving or hosting or interacting with an angel or more plainly, a messenger of God in disguise. And if we are Christians, if we be Christians here this morning, This concept that I'm preaching to you should not be alien to us or to our hearts. For this was and is still today the consistent teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
For Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Although everything else will change, God stays the same. Now when we think of angels, we all probably think, I meant to bring a picture of it and I forgot. But how many have seen that picture of that beautiful angel, long flowing hair and long flowing robe and big beautiful white wings kind of watching over these two little children crossing over, over a bridge? How many have seen that painting before? How many has it in their home? I love that picture. I have, I have it at home too and I, I plumb forgot to bring it to hold up at this point in the message. But I think most of you know what I'm talking about. I love that picture. It's a precious memory from my childhood. You know, we sang that old hymn, precious memory. That's a precious memory from my childhood. We go to the homes of, of, of loved ones and family members and, and fellow Christians and they always, it seemed like everybody had that picture hanging up and it's just, all these men and women of God have these, that picture hanging up. And I love that picture. And it is a precious memory. But even though I love it, that depiction of an angel is not really biblical. <laughs> it's not really what the Bible says an angel looks like. Angels are never depicted like that in the Scriptures. They never appear as women. They never appear with long flowing gowns. Or they never appear with wings like we often think that they do or that they're often drawn or painted in the bible whether the old or the new testament they always appear as a common man sometimes ordinary sometimes with a bright shining white garment but that's how angels in the bible are always described in genesis god himself appeared unto abraham with two angels in the forms of men they visited him and sat. They even ate with him. And the Lord continued to talk to Abraham as the two angels went to Sodom to fet Lotch out. Years later, as Abraham's grandson, Jacob, was returning home with his family, the angel of the Lord, Yahweh or Jehovah himself, the angel of the Lord, met Jacob that night, wrestled with him all night long in the form of a man. And as day broke, he reached down and dislocated Jacob's leg. An angel appeared unto Gideon as sitting under a tree and spoke to him that he was going to be a mighty man of valor and the Lord was with him and that he was chosen of God to be a judge in Israel and to deliver them from their enemies. Unto Samson's parents also did an angel appear. Samson, too, years later, would be a judge in Israel. And the Bible says that the angel of the Lord appeared unto Manoah's wife, parents of Samson, and declared unto her certain things that ought to be done to the son that she and her husband would bear. She went home and told her husband Manoah about it and said, A man of God, a man, appeared unto me. And all the things he said, and Manoah was shocked because his wife was barren. Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, Please let that man of God come to me also. And the Scriptures declare that then came the angel of the Lord to him concerning his future son whom they would name Samson. And even in New Testament times, we find the same types of examples when it comes to the appearance of angels. The angel Gabriel appeared unto Zacharias as he ministered alone in the temple. He appeared unto him to bring the news that Zacharias and his barren wife would bear a son. They were to name him John and that he would, he would turn the hearts of the fathers and the children back to the Lord and he would prepare the way of the Lord. Now nothing is mentioned of Gabriel's appearance. No wings or any such thing. But we can perceive this morning that the word of God is consistent. For this same Gabriel appeared also unto Daniel just as a man. Of course, how can we forget the Blessed Mary who bore our Lord as, as it pertains to the flesh? Same Gabriel appeared unto her and gave glad tidings of her special blessing that she would give birth to that holy thing called the Son of God after being overshadowed by the Holy Ghost. Still, we find more examples in our New Testament. Two angels appeared at the tomb of the risen Jesus to declare that He's not here, but He's risen, just as He said. The description of these two angels' appearance was 
two men standing by wearing shining garments. At the ascension of Jesus, when he went back up into heaven, and as the disciples watched him go up and was received by a cloud out of their sight, the scriptures say, the book of Acts chapter 1, that two men stood by in white apparel and said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven uh, shall so come in like manner, even as you have seen him go up into heaven. Two men standing by. Saints, the point is this morning is that angels aren't going to appear to you in the way that you perceive or the way that perhaps they've been depicted in paintings or pictures or drawings with long flowing robes and and long hair and and, and beautiful wings uh, coming off of their back. They're not going to appear to you in that way. We think of them in that way because that's how we've seen them drawn and depicted uh, many times in our life. Uh, But you know what? Many times in your life already, perhaps you've already uh, interacted with an angel and have never known it. For thereby some have entertained angels unaware. The Bible says that angels are desirous to look into the things of men, especially as it pertains to the elect of God and the gospel being preached and going forth out into the world. They are desirous to look into the things of men. We never know when we may meet a stranger who is in need and really may be an angel sent from God in disguise. Sometimes, maybe the Lord may send one in the form of a poor and destitute person to test what manner of faith we have. If there be any substance to it or not, or maybe to see if we just talk the talk and we don't walk the walk. Listen, the Bible says that faith without works is dead. If we're going to be Christians, then let us be Christians fully and live and love and serve as our Lord would. When we think about following the Lord Jesus, that means we shift our thinking to the way he thinks. That means we shift our speech to the way he speaks. We shift our actions to the way that he acts. Did the Lord ever turn anybody away in need? Never. He may have challenged them a little bit, to teach them something, but he never turned them away that had need. Now, the Lord owns everything, and he has all to give. Sometimes we may not have anything to give, but where we can, let us help, let us love, let us serve. Because there are plenty today, saints, who have need. It doesn't always have to be in the form of money or food or something like that. Sometimes it's simply just being there for somebody in a time of heartache. Really caring about somebody and how they feel and what they're experiencing and what they're going through. Sometimes it's just going to them and comforting them or calling them or just praying with them or offering offering a word of encouragement. Saints, if the church does not imitate the love of Christ, then who? How will the world know Christ but by His church whom He has left here for that purpose? To be His hands and feet upon the earth. To go forward and preach His gospel. To loose the the binding cords of wickedness and sin by the gospel of Jesus Christ by the love of Christ. Not only as we go into this Christmas season, but always, always. This Christmas season is just a a good tool to redirect us and realign us and remind us of our mission and of who we are 
and who we're called to be and who we are made to be. As Christ not only was born in that manger, but born in us. In so much that we were born again and begotten of Him. The Lord Jesus came nearly 2,000 years ago, born into this world, laid in an old feed trough for a crib. He came to save the world by His death upon the cross and resurrection in the payment of sin and justification for all those who will believe on Him. He came with a heart of tender mercies and loving kindness. <clears throat> I used to, when I would see folks out on the corners asking for whatever, I would justify myself in saying that, well, if I give them money, they may go get drunk or they may, uh, may go do this or they may go do that. Or, you know, they really don't want to get out of their situation. They just want to hand out, so I'm not helping. I'm guilty of that in the past. But I don't care to admit it because I can now boast in the glory of the Lord and what He has done and formed in me and changed me. The truth is I was judging them prematurely. The truth is I was going against what 1 Corinthians 13 says, which is, it says don't be quick to accuse or think evil of somebody or something. I don't know that person. You don't know that person. You don't know what they faced and been through. Only they and God know. We've got to be careful when we decide to be the judge because of what judgment and what measure of judgment we judge, we also shall be judged with, Jesus said. Right. If we're going to judge and get the speck out of our brother's eye, we better take the beam of the log out of ours first. Right. We can't be hypocrites when we make a judgment or a decision. Besides that, even if they do misuse it, that parts between them and God. They will answer for that. Not me. But as for me, when I give, when we give, we must give from a pure heart. Isn't that how God gave to us? And are we not to imitate Him? He gave from a pure heart. We must give from a pure heart. The fact that I submit to the love of Christ in me, that's the part that's between God and I. When I give, when I try to help, when I show forth love, what they do with it from that point is between them and God. But we've allowed too much of our societal culture to creep into our identity of who we are. I'm nothing more but a Christian. That's all I want to be. Because everything else of this world will melt away. But Christ will abide forever in His kingdom. Yes, Lord. <clears throat> if we must lean one way or the other on things, let us always lean in the direction of the love of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying we have to agree with everything. Well, we don't. We stand on the truth. We don't bend or break on that. We don't have to be mean. We don't have to be arrogant. We don't have to be proud. But we do have to be humble and abased lest we exalt ourselves and the Lord have to humble us. Let us always lean in the direction of humbleness and kindness and mercy and grace and forgiveness and forbearance and long-suffering for such is the character of the Lord Jesus Christ whether we do it unto brothers or sisters in the church and believers or unto strangers and believers outside the church or even unto angels in disguise that have been sent to test what manner of Christian we really are. God knows, saints. He knows. He knows. He don't have to send an angel to test to know. Because he knows. You know, men look on the outside, but God knows the heart. 
but that there be a witness against us when we stand on the day of judgment that we may know and believe on that day. He may send forth that angel to test and see what manner of Christian we be. And listen, you can't do it out of I'm doing this to make sure that I'm good enough for God or you can't do it out of obligation. That won't work either. You got to come to Christ and yield to him and submit yourself to him and say, Lord, not my way anymore, your way. I mean, you truly got to give yourself over from a pure heart that Christ in you may live through you. And he receives all the glory. And I'm just glad to be saved in it all. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. I'd like to ask them to come get ready for a song. And we'll have a song of invitation this time. <clears throat> but as we close, I want to do so with a little poem that I always enjoy reading to you every single Christmas. <clears throat> and I believe this will just tie up the message all together beautifully if you would... Bear with me for a few more moments here. And this poem is called <clears throat> This poem is called The Christmas Guest. And pray for me that the Lord help me to read this and get through it without squalling and bawling. <clears throat> it happened one day at December's end. Two neighbors called on an old friend. And they found his shop so meager and lean, made merry with thousand bows of green. And Conrad was sitting with face a shine when he suddenly stopped as he stitched a twine. And he said, old friends, at dawn today, when the cock was crowing the night away, the Lord appeared in a dream to me and said, I'm coming your guest to be. So I've been busy with feet of stir, strewing my shop with branches of fir. The table is spread and the kettle is shined, and over the rafters the holly is twined. And now I will wait for my Lord to appear and listen closely so I will hear his step. <clears throat> and as he nears my humble place, and I open the door and look up on his face, so his friends went home and left Conrad alone, for this was the happiest day he had known. For long since, his family had passed away, and Conrad had spent many a sad Christmas day. But he knew with the Lord as his Christmas guest, this Christmas would be the dearest and blessed. And he listened with only joy in his heart. And with every sound, he would rise with a start and look for the Lord to be at his door like the vision he'd had a few hours before. So he ran to the window after hearing a sound, but all that he saw but all that he saw on the snow-covered ground was a shabby beggar whose shoes were torn and all of his clothes were ragged and worn. So Conrad was touched and went to the door and he said, your feet must be frozen and sore. I have some shoes in my shop for you and a coat that'll keep you warmer too. <clears throat> so with grateful heart, the man went away. But Conrad noticed the time of day and wondered what made the dear Lord so late, how much longer he'd have to wait. When he heard a knock and ran to the door, but it was only a stranger once more. A bent old lady with a shawl of black and a bundle of kindling piled on her back. She asked only for a place to rest, but that was reserved for Conrad's great guest. But her voice seemed to plead. Don't send me away. Let me rest for a while on Christmas Day. So Conrad brewed her a steaming cup and told her to sit at the table and sup. But after she left, he was filled with dismay. He 
for he saw that the hours were passing away. And the Lord had not come as he said he would. And Conrad felt sure he had misunderstood. <clears throat> when out of the stillness he heard a cry, Please help me and tell me where am I? So again he opened his friendly door and stood disappointed as twice before. It was only a child who had wandered away and lost from her family on Christmas Day. Again, Conrad's heart was heavy and sad, but he knew that he should make this little child glad. So he called her in and wiped her tears. and quieted all of her childish fears. Then he led her back to her home once more. But as he entered his own darkened door, he knew that the Lord was not coming today. For the hours of Christmas had passed away. So he went to his room and knelt down to pray, and he said, Dear Lord, why did you delay? What kept you from coming to call on me? For I wanted so much your face to see. When soft in the silence, the voice he heard, lift up your head. For I kept my word three times, my shadow. Three times, my shadow crossed your floor. Three times, I came to your lonely door. For I was the beggar with bruised cold feet. Thank you, sweetheart. I was the woman you gave something to eat. And I was the child on the homeless street. Three times I knocked. And three times I came in. And each time I found the warmth of a friend. Of all the gifts, love is the best. And I was honored to be your Christmas guest. Saints, if you'll stand with us, let us worship the Lord Jesus one more time in His great love. If anybody here has a need, these altars are open. We're here to anoint you and pray with you.